All right, it's uh, 6.30. I'd like to call our meeting to order. I'd like to welcome everyone to our meeting tonight. This is our first informational meeting for 2022. As many of you know, I'm Jim Mercer, treasurer and licensed operator of Housatonic Water. I'd like to introduce our engineer, Robert Ferrari, president of Northeast Water Solutions based in Exeter, Rhode Island, who will present the information regarding the pilot program tonight. Welcome, Bob. Uh, good evening, um, Jim and, and all the other uh, participants. Um, just by way of introduction, uh, my company is Northeast Water Solutions. Uh, I'm the president and founder of the company. And regarding my own credentials, um, I'm a professional engineer and also a certified public water system operator. I've got 45 years experience uh, focusing uh, substantially on uh, water quality, water treatment, uh, corrosion control, uh, things of that nature. Uh, my firm, Northeast Water Solutions, uh, we are the engineers for uh, approximately 100 to 150 uh, public water systems. In addition to that, our operating division operates about 95 or 100 public water systems of varying sizes, uh, up to and including systems doing a half a million gallons a day, uh, three quarters of a million gallons per day. Um, additional credentials I have is I, I do a substantial amount of work in uh, forensic engineering, uh, an expert witness testimony associated with uh, water quality issues and corrosion. Um, I'm involved in projects throughout the United States. Um, and since 2016, I've been uh, an expert consultant for the state of Michigan uh, related to uh, the issues that occurred in Flint, Michigan. Uh, that work is ongoing. Uh, and I'm also involved in um, uh, similar projects and other types of corrosion uh, failure projects throughout the United States. Uh, we were contacted several months ago by, uh, by Jim Mercer. And um, after uh, having some, uh, you know, being introduced to the system and, and reviewing the, uh, the, the water quality um, uh, conditions and the treatment system uh, and the current status as far as water quality, we provided a proposal for engineering services and to run, uh, to conduct a pilot plant program and uh, to carry it as far as implementation of a manganese treatment system. And we've been retained by Houston Tonic Water Works Company to do that. And, um, and we're involved, we're moving forward with that project. So uh, by way of uh, introduction, uh, if anybody wants to know anything further, I'd be more than happy to uh, provide additional information. Thank you, Bob. So we'll uh, start the presentation now. First, I'd like to, like to let everyone know that we share your concerns with the, the situation that we have with the manganese and thank many of the customers who reached out to us and offered support during these very challenging times. It's been a long time to process and gather the information and getting the right professionals in place to deal with this complex situation. The format for tonight's presentation is an, uh, a PowerPoint slideshow uh, with a presentation by Bob and then questions regarding the pilot program at the end. So I'll start the program with the um, first like to do it we had to do the introduction next on to the system overview. Housatonic Water serves about 1400 customers. We average about 107,000 gallons a day. We have a, a largely undeveloped watershed and we have a high quality water except for periodic spikes of uh, manganese. Treatment includes slow sand filtration and chlorine disinfection. We use as few chemicals as possible to keep the water uh, natural. Chlorine is the only chemical that we add at this point. The process that we're looking at with the manganese uh, removal will uh, continue along that, that, that same route with adding very few chemicals and uh, trying to keep it as simple as possible so that people uh, have confidence in the, the water supply. The chlorine contact tank and million gallon storage tank provide disinfection and contact time. We have 16 miles of pipe, which varies from two to 14 inches in diameter. 
and we have periodic uh, problems of discolored water, which, uh, which you're all aware of. This is our water quality team. Uh, we have uh, BIS Corp, uh, Carl Luter's company and environmental instrument services who do independent instrument calibrations and assist in that area. Housatonic Basin does our, our independent water sampling. We don't collect the samples ourselves. They come up to the uh, reservoir and, do, and throughout several locations in town and do those, uh, those um, collections. Microback, which is one of the largest labs in the country, does the, the testing. Uh, our, one, our team of engineers include Lennard Engineering, who has done system design and they, they, they've done a hydraulic study, which is another area that we're looking at, which will probably be a, uh, a topic for our next meeting. Uh, we have uh, Cornwell Engineering who evaluated corrosion control and lead and copper. We had Northeast uh, Water Solutions with, with uh, Bob. And of course we had uh, Rich Gullick who uh, has done a lot of work with uh, the system, including identifying manganese as the issue that uh, we're, we're currently dealing with. This is a schematic of, of our plant. We have Long Pond. We have two filters that were built in 1939. We have equipment thereafter, the filters that, that test their turbidity and flow. We had chlorine at that point, which goes on to the contact basin and mixes, uh, it's like a large maze. So it gets a lot of time for the chlorine to react with the water to uh, kill any pathogens. We measure chlorine pH and temperature after the contact time, contact basin. Then that goes to a million gallon storage tank. And before it goes to town, we measure chlorine, uh, turbidity, pH, temperature and flow. As you know, manganese has been problematic for the, the past few summers. It's a naturally occurring in the environment. Our maximum measured level 0.26 is below the health advisory, but concentrations uh, increase in Long Pond during the summer, some summers, not every summer, but the, the last few. For decades, we didn't have any, any situations with manganese. Now, like many other utilities in the Northeast, we're having manganese issues. Once oxidized like by chlorine, and Bob will explain this in more detail, they uh, can cause color. And that's the color that some people have seen in, in their, their water. The water is safe to drink. It meets this, the standards. The uh, concern, of course, is the color. And uh, I know some people are averse to drinking it. And uh, I don't blame them, really. We were working on a, 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 the proper approach to, to, to rectify that. Other, other factors, you know, everyone wants to blame uh, the color on uh, manganese, but other times there is color in the water. It can come from iron. Like when we're flushing the lines, we, that's our, our house cleaning, which we just completed last month. And the water gets all stirred up and we clear it all out through the hydrants. And as it settles down, sometimes people notice discoloration. Also periodically we have water main breaks where we have to turn off a whole section of town. That again creates a lot of roily water and, and uh, causes discoloration. Ditto for uh, fire flows. If there's a fire and it pulls a lot of water through the lines very quickly, uh, you, you, you can get color. Sometimes we have it, sometimes we don't. And lastly, our scheduled work. Sometimes we, uh, and we have to turn off a section of town or replace a hydrant. Yeah, you do have those, those situations there. There's additional information on our website regarding manganese. Uh, and we encourage you to look at it. It's under the section, Our Water. So that's available and, and feel free to get, give the office a call if you have any, any further questions. Now it's on to you, Bob. Okay, well, thank you, Jim. Um, Northeast Water has been uh, retained to initially conduct a, a pilot plant program uh, the purpose of that program is to install um, equipment that's a somewhat smaller scale than what the full size system would be. And we would run it through multiple, uh, what we call operating cycles. Uh, this is to evaluate both the raw water quality, the performance of the treatment process itself, and the, uh, and the finished water quality. Um, 
this this work can't be done in a, in a couple of days. We're actually planning on probably being uh, running this pilot plant for uh, I mean, absolute minimum of two weeks, and quite quite possibly or quite probably uh, four weeks. Uh, the equipment, by the way, has been ordered. Uh, we did a design, and it'll be uh, installed um, temporarily uh, in the uh, existing um, uh, treatment facility. Uh, the findings of this pilot plan program uh, will be used to uh, validate the system performance, the process performance, to provide the um, formal basis of design for the full-scale system. Uh, we've already performed a preliminary design based upon um, a fairly substantial uh, base of information uh, provided by uh, Houston Tonic Waterworks Company. Um, the process we're proposing to use, and by the way, there are uh, quite a few treatment processes for removal of manganese from, from uh, a water supply. Uh, in this case, it's a surface water supply, so it has some unique characteristics that have to be dealt with. Um, we're going to be using um, a, a form. It's now it's, it's a synthetic form of manganese green sand. Um, the original green sand is a natural zeolite. Um, we're going to be using a, um, a synthetic um, form of this that's actually manufactured by the uh, same folks who have been selling green sand for almost 100 years. Um, it's, it's referred to as Green Sand Plus. That's the trade name for it. This media, uh, in either form, uh, it has, uh, it's, it's a granular filter media. It's approximately the size of uh, typical beach sand, if you want to kind of put this in perspective. Uh, it's got uh, what they call oxidative and uh, exchange properties. And uh, what that means is that when you set up the, whether it's the pile plant or the full scale system, you would inject an oxidant ahead of the filter system. In this case, it's already occurring. The uh, facility already is chlorinating the water. That's a, that's a very powerful oxidant. And we carry that oxidant, that chlorine residual through the filter system. That oxidizes manganese. And uh, it also, if we maintain the chlorine residual, which we're required to for control of of pathogens that maintains the media in what they call a continuously regenerated condition. So we always have the, uh, the, the media in a fully oxidative state, which is important because any manganese that isn't pre-oxidized before entering the filter will be oxidized uh, within the filter bed. And once the, the manganese is oxidized, it, it, it converts from a dissolved solid to a particulate solid and it's filtered out in the media. This process, by the way, has been in use. The green sand process has been in use since at least the 1930s. The continuous regeneration process has been in use since approximately 1960. So there's a very substantial operating history. Uh, it's the most widely used process for removal of manganese um, in, in the United States, if not the world. Um, it's, it's simple, it's effective, and it's very repeatable. Okay? And, and those are very key properties. There's no adverse impact upon the pH of the water, the taste of the water, odor, any other of the aesthetic uh, qualities. And obviously the intent is we would optimally, we would get manganese removal to, uh, a, to a point of non-detection. Um, and uh, that's, the, that's the ultimate objective, although we, just, we established a, uh, a worst case design goal of 0 0.01 milligrams per liter, which is uh, substantially below the water quality limit, which is 0 0.05. And that's, by the way, a secondary limit. Uh, in any event, um, the process, both at the pilot plant scale and the full scale, would be directly integrated into the existing uh, treatment, you know, process flow in the facility, uh, which is which is very good because uh, it can it, that makes it very easy to implement e effectively. It would be installed and operating downstream of the transfer pumps that pump the finished water to the existing um, storage tank, and so uh, it, it, again, it's that makes it very simple to implement uh, and maintain. Also, this next slide is a presentation 
This is ostensibly of the pilot plant, but it also gives you a reasonably good uh, process flow illustration of the full scale system. Uh, it would utilize, uh, the pilot plant will utilize three vessels operating in parallel and the water uh, flows through them. In our pilot plant, we will be testing because we're gonna use three filters in parallel that allows us to test different operating conditions, whether it's hydraulic loading rate, um, chlorine dosages, pressure differentials, things like that, backwash frequencies, et cetera, which allow us to test a wide range of, of operating criteria uh, so that we have a substantial database for us to uh, ultimately do the final design of, of the full scale system. We'll be taking samples of the water going into the filters, the water, the treated water coming out. Um, we have a very extensive water quality um, monitoring program involved here because we have to produce a uh, sufficient um, performance evaluation and validation for the full scale system. By the way, the pilot plant proposal uh, was submitted. Yeah, there's an application currently uh, with MassDEP. They have to approve the pilot plant. I anticipate, you know, they did provide us a few comments. We will be finishing our response to those tomorrow. They weren't anything particularly major. Um, and then when we get done, we have to submit the design uh, with the appropriate supporting documentation to MassDEP for review and approval. And only after that can the full-scale implementation occur. Um, as I said, we'll be doing the work uh, the pile plant will run this summer. Uh, and the reason is because that's your peak season as far as having manganese in the water. This photo is simply a typical pile plant. It's not actually the pile plant we'll be using um, um, at the Houstonic Waterworks facility. Uh, the vessels we'll be using are actually larger than this, but I wanted to provide something to illustrate, you know, uh, approximately what would be done the reason we would use flexible piping in this situation is simply because we want the ability to, um, if we have to modify the system quickly, and if we had, you know, fixed piping, it would be more difficult to do this way. It makes life. The vessels will actually be quite a bit larger than these vessels that we're going to use for the pile plant, but this is just to give you some sense of what's going on. The, um, the filter media is inside the vessels. The water flows in or through the filtration process, and then, and then we'll, again, comes out the, the outlet end and then moves on to the next step in the process. Um, the good news here is also because there's substantial instrumentation already in the facility, uh, we all, that it really enables us to have a very extensive database so we can demonstrate you know, the system operation and it, that it doesn't deviate from, you know, the normal operation, you know, the summertime operation of the, of the, of the water treatment facility. And that's important that we can demonstrate that we're functioning and performing under normal or typical operating conditions for the plant. We're taking a stream from the full size plant uh, and, that, and that's, that, that's critical in this situation. So Jim, if we could have the next slide, please. So the, just to recap uh, quickly, the purpose of a pilot plant, again, assess the critical operating conditions and variables, uh, determine the key criteria for successful system operation. We'll go through multiple operating cycles. And that's key here, folks. It has to be a repeatable process. It has to be easily repeatable. That's a very important thing as far as the long-term success uh, and performance of the system to ensure that manganese is consistently removed. Um, the, uh, our target is actually to be below detection. We're saying here below the 0 0.01 milligram per liter. Um, and again, this will support the final design. We're also going to do an evaluation of disinfection byproducts. Um, the facility already utilizes chlorination. So we'll be able to, again, build off the existing database. Uh, but there will be, uh, that will be part of the program here. Um, which I think is also going to be very beneficial as far as providing information to mass DEP. Um, there'll be an overall finished water quality evaluation. Everything will be submitted to mass DEP for their review. And then uh, and with the ultimate objective to optimize the integration of the full scale system you know, into the uh, existing uh, Houston Tonic Waterworks um, you know, facility. 
Um, to touch on the validation for a moment, and again, this is this is a very extensive uh, program. I got to, not to repeat myself, but again, it's multiple operating cycles of the filters. When I say multiple, it's not one or two. We're, we're talking, say, five to 10, maybe even more operating cycles for the filters. That's one of the reasons we use smaller filter vessels because we wanna make sure we get a lot of operating cycles on them to see how repeatable the process is and it's consistent. Um, again, we're, we have to validate the uh, effluent manganese. We have to validate the chlorine dosage, uh, the residual, uh, the disinfection byproducts, uh, the hydraulic loading. Again, the, the, the media can perform differently with different hydraulic loading rates, which is a key factor. Uh, cycle duration, uh, there's a whole range of parameters and also uh, operating pressures and differential pressure across the filters. That's another key operating variable that can impact turbidity. So we need to assess that also. So there's a, there's a lot that's going to be done. And I also like to stress that this is a very transparent process. Ultimately, everything submitted to Mass DEP is public record information. Um, and so there's, you know, this will be a very transparent process by both um, it's appropriate and it's necessary. This is simply, this is a photograph of a, of a full scale system. This system is in Situate, Massachusetts. Uh, we installed this uh, approximately, uh, I think it was three years ago, two or three years ago. Uh, it's about a 150 gallon a minute system. I provided this photo because the full scale system that we would anticipate for Houstonic Waterworks it's probably gonna be very similar to this. The question is, do we need three vessels or four? But this, this is a very similar, this was shortly following, I think this photo was taken, it was when we were just had just completed the mechanical installation of the equipment. And um, we hadn't yet gone through the final startup yet. We'd already completed the pilot plant, but we were still working through the, fu the full scale uh, system installation and startup. So just to give you some idea, this is installed in pump house 10, uh, in Situate, Massachusetts, as a matter of fact. So that concludes the, uh, my base presentation uh, and certainly we'll ask any, answer any questions we can. Sure, so if anyone has any questions, please uh, raise your hand and I can promote you to ask your question. I have one question regarding, uh, uh, is Tonic paying for the cost with no request for a rate increase? Uh, at, at this point, this will all be packaged as part of a rate increase, whatever monies we spend on the manganese uh, treatment. But there'll no, be no immediate uh, cost to the to rate payers at this point. It'll be packaged going forward. At the height of the meeting, we had 38 uh, attendees. And again, I invite anyone to, that has any questions to please uh, Okay. Jane, please unmute yourself and you can ask a question. Hi, Jane. I wonder if you would comment on the HAA5 in the water. I understand it is now below the legal limit, but that it has uh, spiked recently. It's, it's actually, it's been trending downward. And it, one of the things that uh, Bob will be looking at is collecting that data and presenting it going farther in some sort of study regarding the, the, the aliceic acid, et cetera. Bob, did you want to comment on that at all? Sure. Um, there was, um, you know, there, there was in previous, HAAs are one of the disinfection byproduct species that monitored quarterly and, um, and compliance is based upon a, um, a four quarter annual like running average. Uh, the, the results that have been received, um, say in the last quarter, is showing a downward trend from a high from last year. The pilot plant will be in, including an evaluation of disinfection byproducts. Um, you know, because we have to look at the uh, the impact of the treatment system upon the chlorine, the overall chlorine dosage, the chlorine residual, and we're looking at factors such as by removing the manganese you know, that can have some effect on how much chlorine is used in the system. 
We're also looking at factors such as hydraulic retention time. Uh, there's, there's test methodologies we can use to evaluate that. That's, that's all very important because we want to make sure that at, at minimum, there's no adverse impact and optimally, uh, we would be able to help affect some beneficial improvements relative to disinfection byproducts. And, but if, if nothing else, it gives, it gives us and gives Houston Tonic Waterworks Company um, you know, a more, an even more thorough understanding. Uh, Rick, by the way, Rich Golick has done some excellent work for the, for the system. Uh, he's a recognized expert in disinfection byproducts, but our work uh, will be building off of some work that Rich has done previously uh, and the Waterworks Company has done previously. So again, that's, a, that's an important part of this evaluation is a further assessment of disinfection byproducts. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I also have a question here regarding uh, some of the tuned in late. Uh, they, they were questioning the timeline for the project. Uh, once we get the approval from DEP to, to start the, the uh, pilot study, we'll be doing it this summer, collecting the data, and then finalizing that and putting it into a, a, another application of DEP to do cons final construction, which will take place in uh, over after, that, after that's approved. So go the winter, the fall, third and fourth quarters of 2022 and have it ready for the, the spring and summer of next year. I have another question here. Um, Maggie, please unmute yourself and you can ask your question. Okay. Um, is manganese what's coloring the water, what's turning it brown? And if that's the case, why isn't everyone's water brown? Would you like me to take that, Jim? Sure. Okay, manganese can result in some level of water discoloration, okay? Uh, when manganese is oxidized, it can, it can range in color, believe it or not, from yellow all the way to black. It's very commonly observed as a black deposit, okay? Um, one of the factors that can impact uh, almost any water distribution system, and uh, I suspect is a factor uh, in Housatonic's waterworks system, is the fact that you can be putting water, you can be uh, distributing water that actually has non-detectable manganese, let's say, as well as say non-detectable iron and other metals. And yet you can get some discoloration in the distribution system. As, as, as Jim had mentioned earlier, um, that can be due to, um, you know, the uh, evolution of sediments within the system that can be very localized. Say if you're having, if you have a fire in a given locale, uh, that's a sudden surge of water for a period of time that can actually loosen up deposits. You can have a localized, um, you know, hit of, of, of solids at this color of the water, or if you have a line break, that could, that's another common uh, occurrence. However, getting back to the specifics of Maggie's question, um, manganese can certainly cause discoloration. I want to point out that all of the documentation we have, and by the way, it's there's a lot of analytical work going back several years. The manganese level is not consistent in the water. And so uh, it, it's, it's very highly variable from non-detectable to, you know, something, uh, you know, to somewhat elevated levels. It's not severely elevated, but so that's another factor in here. It's, it's not like we have a consistent level coming in every day. We don't. So it can come and go in the system, so to speak. And that's why you can sometimes get very variable impact. Um, and then, of course, the system hydraulics are another factor. Um, again, these are these are issues that we 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 hope to evaluate, you know, in in depth, quite a few of them, um, and in conjunction with the hydraulic evaluation that's been performed for the distribution system. This is again all this all these studies and evaluation is ultimately tied together and and, and to help resolve a problem. And, and again, historically, we haven't had a problem with manganese. It's really something that happened in 2018. And there are uh, several other utilities within the Massachusetts and many within the Northeast that have, are having issues with mag manganese. Now, uh, because we're a surface supply, you know, you, 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 the rains change the, the, the chemistry. 
overall weather, a hot summer or a wet summer, they don't, they all change the chemistry of the, the surface supply. But there, it's not only just uh, surface supplies that are affected by manganese. There's a lot of wells, both private wells and public utilities that uh, use wells for uh, their supply that also have issues with manganese. But if it's not a surface supply, oftentimes it's more control and the, the data is different than it's not, it doesn't fluctuate as much as the uh, surface supply. So that's one of the challenges that's taken us this, this long to get to this point. It's taken us time to collect all that data and have it all analyzed. Um, thank, thank you, Maggie. Uh, I have an, another question from um, uh, Liz. Yes, Jim, this call, this question is for um, Robert. What is his projected competency that this will work and will addition, um, solve the problem? Um, and while this process is going on, shouldn't the aging pipes also be replaced to um, help with the problem? I, um, to answer your question best, the purpose of the pilot plant, well, let me back up. I am, let's just say 99.9% .9 certain that the green sand filtration process will be successful. The purpose of the pilot plant is to validate the performance of the system that indeed it will be successful. Uh, that, that creates the basis and the justification for installing it, okay? Um, what I will tell you is um, I've been involved in um, more than 100 such systems throughout the country, as well as quite a few in Massachusetts and New England, and designed correctly, they work. And obviously, we would, you know, we've never had one that didn't work. I'll put it that way. Okay. Um, but again, it's a, it's a, it's a very, the reason this, this, this process technology is, is successful is because it's, it's a very simple, straightforward process. Um, it's got, uh, a fairly limited number of critical operating variables and that are relatively, you know, e normally easy to control. And it also can deal with highly variable levels of manganese or, you know, say iron in the water. It's, it's also used for iron treatment also, as a matter of fact. Um, that's one of the benefits of this process. Um, and you don't have to pre-oxidize all the manganese Often you don't, and you actually re re remove it within the filter bed. So again, we have a very high confidence level to be supported uh, by the performance of the pilot plant. And it's, it's contingent upon us to do a thorough and complete, uh, you know, pilot plant pro you know, performance and evaluation. And of course, this ultimately goes through the regulatory review process. Um, and I can assure you that MassDEP is very rigorous in their reviews. Uh, there's no question about that. Um, I will defer to Jim relative to the distribute the comments or potential answers regarding the distribution system simply because I, I don't have nearly the familiarity with, with the distribution system. Right. We, we submitted a hydraulic study on the uh, distribution system and it identified certain lines that should be replaced over time. There is not an immediate need to replace the lines like some have suggested. Uh, if you look at our historic break rate, it's, it's very low for the industry. Uh, so that, that's, that's, that's really a fallacy that everything needs to replace the entire system. Uh, so that's really the, the, that on that topic there. Any other questions for um, either of us, Liz? Um, I just wonder if the um, replacing the pipes, how can it not contribute to the... Um, problem to um, solving the problem um, along with this pilot program. It Again, seems every little bit of help has got to do something to be a positive outcome. Well, the, the, the manganese is a result of the, the, the water and the manganese and the, the supply. It's, it's, not, it's not being leached out by the pipes. Uh, so that, that they're really separate issues and I think we should be viewing those as such. I think one of the issues I think that people should recognize, and we, we've discussed this at previous meetings, is that there are a lot of houses in Housatonic that have service lines that are 60, 70, 80, 100 years old. And most of those service lines are iron. And that can certainly contribute to discolored water to those individual houses. 
Additionally, we have, I think there's like 10 or 12 uh, private roads in, in Housatonic that have mains that they, they, they actually own and maintain. And most of those are similar age and, and need work. And in fact, we've had, whenever we have a break, it's always a challenge to get everyone on board to, to repair it. It's kind of like the town. The town has roads they're not, they have not accepted. They don't own or maintain. And that's the same with us. And I know there's a few customers that, uh, that have compromised water that are on these lines. And these lines oftentimes don't have blow offs or hydrants at the end. So there's no way, way for us to flush those. So consequently, as those steel lines deteriorate, they, they do get sediment in their water on a more regular basis, which uh, could, could be remedied by them replacing those lines. So that, that's the situation with that. Uh, next question. Uh, Linda. Yes, um, you, you mentioned briefly about a, a raise in the water, in the cost of the water because of all the work that you're actually doing on it. Um, can you speak a little more about that? Do you, do you have an idea of the percentage uh, increase that that would make? Uh, no, we don't at this point because we don't know what the, we don't, we really don't. That, that will be a topic for a further meeting when we have more information on that. We haven't been for a rate increase for since uh, for six years. We fired our last rate increase in 2016. I see. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank, you. thank you. And um, let's see here. Philip. Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. And, uh, this is Philip Orenstein. Uh, I'm looking back at your uh, prior update, uh, the letter that you uh, released October, or dated October 1st, 2021. And just quoting from the middle of that letter, it says, quote, our goal is to have the membrane system pilot in place well before the temperatures in Long Pond start to rise again next summer. Based upon your comments tonight, it seems like that timeline has significantly been moved back. Can you uh -huh. speak to that? Sure. We actually, we were looking at doing a completely different system last year. We had a uh, Zoom meeting regarding it. We we're looking at replacing the filters and addressing the uh, manganese issue with a, a rapid sand filter system by Coke, Coke Industries. And as we got further into it and collected more data, we realized that it was not suitable for removing the manganese. So we, we actually changed and hired um, consultants to review the best way to address just the manganese. We also, if you look historically at our filters, you know, they, they, they were put in 1939, but they're, they're like an old recipe. Old recipes just don't need to be replaced. Oftentimes they're, they're wonderful. And that it really is the case with a slow sand filter. We don't have to add any chemicals. It's, it's a biologic process. It's very effective. If, if you look at the rates of uh, filtration and the, the uh, pathogens that are removed, it's, it's a very high quality system that's working very well. And as a complement to it, this, this system that has been designed by, um, by Bob complements it. And I think it's a, a cost-effective way to get a very high quality product. And that's why we're doing what we're doing. Well, just to follow up on that, the, the, the previous al alternative, which I guess is the Coke system, was expected to cost less than $2 million. I'm quoting from you, that letter. Correct. Do you, do you have any, can you estimate the cost of this particular system that you've now shifted to? Uh, I don't want to speak without having all the information. In addition to uh, the, the, the study that we're doing and the installation of just the, just the system, which runs about $200,000, we'd also need to have a different facility to put them in because it's, it's a, it would not fit in the existing plant that we have. So those numbers we're working on, and when we have those numbers, we'll be presenting those. So it will be substantially less than, than the, the $2 million for the, uh, the, the, the treatment facility. 
Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Alex? Alex, if you unmute yourself, please. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, so my question is, um, in your recent letter, it mentioned that haleocytic acid is harmful or can potentially be harmful to infants and women who are pregnant. And as someone who has a one-year-old and I'm looking to become pregnant in the future, what do you suggest that we do? Um, because filling the bathtub every night for my son is a little bit anxiety inducing, not knowing the harm that we may be doing onto him. Well, I, we certainly under, understand that. And it, it, our, our levels are on the decrease as you, as you, see, as you can see. However, I, it really comes down to a comfort level which your pediatrician advises. I, I, I really don't, wouldn't like to advise you on that but it really comes down to what you feel comfortable doing. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. I don't see any other hands up. I do have some questions in the uh, question and answer that people typed in. Oh, there's one question regarding the, uh, the website not being clickable. And uh, we're, we'll resolve that. I, I don't know how to do it personally, but I, I will, by the next time we have these meetings, have the link clickable so people don't have to type it in. Thank you for that comment. Are there any other uh, questions here? I, I don't see any other hands up. Seeing no uh, further questions, uh, Bob, are there any further comments you'd like to add? Um, the only thing I think at this point would be just that um, I want to assure all the uh, all the all the people both on this on this uh, meeting and is in, and all of the users in the system that the work we do will be thorough, complete, professional, uh, and transparent. And, uh, you know, there's no, there's no secrets in this process. And our goal is to work with the uh, Houston Tonic Water Works and with the system uh, community and to make sure that the appropriate upgrades are made and it works for the, it works for the system and for the community and, and is satisfactory to also to Mass DEP and, and all the regulatory oversight that we have, so. That's the process and that's our goal and we will hold to that. Thank you, Bob. Thank you for participating in tonight's meeting. And again, uh, there's more information on our website. And if you have any further questions, feel free to call, call the office. And uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Good night. Bye-bye.